Hello, Nigel. Um, Good to be here. Um, first of all, I know we have a short slot of time, so a couple of questions I want to get into there. First of all, very topical stuff about immigration and asylum seekers. Uh, we do still have lots of people coming in on small boats, and we have the biggest backlog we have ever seen. How would you want to handle that? Yeah, 160,000 now, the backlog. Um, and we learned today that 12,000 have been selected, mm. appears to me to be almost at random, and they will simply be waved through. Simply waved through. Simply given refugee status on the basis of filling in a form. Uh, many of them will have no passports, no ID, will have to just believe who they say they are. Uh, and that presents a huge threat. A threat at all sorts of levels, actually. A threat, a threat within communities, a threat to national security, I mean, particularly as the five countries that we're saying yes to are actually war zones mm -hmm. and areas that have been known to have severe Islamic extremism. So you can't, you, you can't underestimate how serious this is or how much people care about it. So the five countries, Afghanistan, yep. mm -hmm. Libya, Eritrea, Syria, Yemen. OK. Um, according to the Refugee Council, of all the applicants that ever come from those countries, 95% will be eligible. Well, of course. That's the only way you can clear the backlog. You just say yes. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that's how it works. As so, of course, as they're right. How many of them should be qualified as genuine refugees? Well, if you look at the way we've done refugee status in Britain for centuries, very, very few. I mean, what is the real definition of a refugee? Well, it's, a, it's, it, it's an individual who, because of their religion, their race, their orientation, their views, is directly in fear of their life and liberty. That is the classical definition. So, you know, take for example the Ugandan Asians that came, 27,000 that came, going back a few years. You know, Armin said, I am going to kill you. <laughs> I mean, fairly clear they were refugees. Similarly with, you know, Jewish kids that came from Austria or from Germany. You know, again, the same thing. So this is a completely, complete twisting of any historical uh, from definition. The British, but also the UNHCR, fulfilling their criteria of what would be a justified well, refugee. And that's interesting as well, because, you see, you know, in 1951, we drew up a UNHCR definition, and that seems to have expanded to be anyone coming from any part of the world uh, that is either in turmoil or the new definition, poverty. Well, that means about five billion can come. So we've got to get a grip on this. We haven't got a grip on this. The British public wants us to get a grip on this. And, and frankly, when it comes to the channel, uh, we've got to do what the Australians did. You know, they faced exactly the same situation that we've got. Uh, this went on for year after year. Uh, they initially tried offshore processing. And we could do that. You know, we could use ocean liners and put people on there and process it or attempt to process each application. But that in turn leads to problems. And in the end, what the Australians did was they simply said, nobody that comes via this route will ever gain refugee Well, let's status. look at other examples of where, I mean, that is, some may argue, is easier to do in Australia. Similar strategy has no, been... No, 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 we're an island too. OK, we're an island. But, OK, Italy has tried similar policies. Matteo Salvini tried it. I mean, how do you feel about the way in which Salvini tried this in, in Italy? Well, the problem is that all the while you've got a European Convention on Human Rights and you've got a court above it and your national law is subject to it, you know, you can make shows of strength, which is, what, which is what Salvini was trying to do, but you can't be effective. I mean, look, it took us 10 years to deport terrorist suspect Abu Hamza. 10 years because of appeals, because of this concept of ECHR, which was brought into British law by Blair under the Human Rights Act. Now, you know, it surely is the right of a, of a civilised sovereign, and we are a civilised country. You know, I won't accept anyone saying that, oh, well, if we're not part of it, we'll be like Belarus. No, we won't. We won't. And, and actually, when it comes to treating people fairly and reasonably, I think we can teach Europe a lesson and not the other way round. I mean, I, you know, and I really do mean that. So we, we, we've got to get tough. And, and frankly, I think what you've seen today with the 12,000 people that are going to be amnested, there's no other word I can use for it, uh, then I think the border force projection of 60,000 coming this year, you can double it. You can double it. Sure. If there, if there are that number of people and they're all coming in on small boats, 
you aren't going to stop it straight away. And so I'm going to return to the Italian example yeah. again. You've got Giorgio Maloney saying things like, uh, on the record, of saying, uh, repatriate migrants back to their countries, then sink the boats that rescued them. Would, that, you, know, would you go that far? Well, that's happening already. Every okay. single day on the beaches of northern France, boats are having knives put in them. All right? So boat wrecking is a well-known tactic. The problem is, with inflatable rubber dinghies, there are factories in China and Turkey that can, that can produce them more quickly than the police can get rid of them. They, that doesn't work. You know, manning the beaches in France doesn't work. If you look at it, you know, you've got boats leaving from as far north as Le Pan all the way down to Burke, which is way down past Latouque. You've, you've now got nearly a 70-mile section of French coast off which these boats are launching. So, so you can attempt to deal with all of these things, but all the while people know if they, through a criminal trafficker, set foot on UK soil, there is a 99% chance of them staying. They will continue to come. So number one, okay. you have to say, nobody that comes via this route will ever be granted refugee status. Okay. Number two, and this, this is the much harder bit, You've got to turn those boats around and take them back to France. OK, well, let's look at this from a different angle then, because we're assuming that the people that are coming are a burden. They are um, of, of no use to the UK. Uh, in, in Devon, we have a lot of agriculture. In Devon, we also have the experience mm. of people, uh, asylum seekers, staying with very little money and means in hotels in some of the seaside resorts. Uh, but if these people, many of whom are skilled, many of whom are professionals... How would you know? Um, How would you know? They have no ID. You can't track their background. So the point about agricultural workers in Devon is this. And this is quite an important point. You know, I've spoken to quite a few of the farmers in North Devon about this over the years, because they want labour. Sure. And I understand they want labour. But there's no problem in having an overseas worker scheme where people come for a six-month season or four-month season or whatever it is, uh, they come from a country with an ID, we're able to check their police records, they come, uh, they have health insurance for the period of time they're here, they earn their money. Everyone's happy. There's no problem with that. There's no problem with that. I mean, hey, you know, I've worked in different parts of the world. You know, we live in a very interconnected world. The issue here, the real issue here, isn't even cost. It isn't even the seven million quid a day we're spending on hotels, in, although that does enrage people. The real issue is one of culture, and security. Now, the security issue, well, I'm afraid, and, and the two are linked. You know, I've seen what's happened in Brussels. I've seen what's happened in Brussels. You would not let your daughter walk down the central streets of Brussels after 8 p.m. at night. You wouldn't let her do it because she would be hassled all the time. You only have to look at what's happened in, I mean, Stockholm. It's almost unbelievable what has happened in Stockholm. We have to understand that the majority of these young men are coming from countries in which women aren't even second-class citizens. That is a huge, huge problem. And nobody wants to talk about it. It's too awkward. All right. You talk about the security element. Mm. I hear what you say about the cultural element, mm. but the security element. Um, we, well, the security uh, element is uh, very... Uh, we've we spoken about... Uh, I mean, there well, are well, 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 let's deal with security. Back. Let's deal with security, yeah. right? Let's deal with security. Of the last 12 terrorist outrages in this country, seven of them have been people that have come in, have been referred to the Prevent Program. We've had, you know, alarm bells flashing about who they may or may not be. Now, you know, the first duty of government is to protect its citizens. So we need to have a really long, hard think about this. And the biggest problem, we, we just talked a moment ago about Libya and, yeah. Ye and Yemen, all right? Well, you, as, as you well know, Libya was the birthplace of ISIS. Mm -hmm. That's where it came from. Now, you could argue we caused it too by an unnecessary war there, but that's, <laughs> that's going back too far, perhaps. So, so you've got, how do we know these young men coming in are not, are not ISIS? Of course, and, and I'm going to interrupt you there, though, be simply because mm. some of the links and the data there may be out of date, and that is to say that Devon and Cornwall Police, along with many of the other police forces across the country, will tell you that the biggest threat of terrorism, terrorist activity, is from right-wing extremists. Absolute cobblers. And not Absolute from cobblers. religious extremists. Absolute Not nonsense. just one police force no, 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 saying no, no, that, no, the majority no. of police well, forces well, in that the country are saying that. That shows you the mess our police are in. Just look at the stats. I just gave you a simple statistic. Those, I just gave you a simple... stats. I just gave you a simple statistic of the last 12 terrorist outrages. Seven 
were committed by jihadi extremists who'd come into Britain very recently and had been referred to prevent. And in fact, the William Shawcross, the William Shawcross report, the independent report into prevent that was published two weeks ago, said the police have got this all very, very wrong indeed. We've talked a little bit about the potential contribution of, of various people. I, I want to just go back to a programme that you did a fortnight ago, um, which caused some upset among Sikhs. Really? Yes. How? Where? Uh, where? Because, uh, <laughs> indeed, there was one particular group <laughs> um, uh, uh, that when you were talking about one of the boats coming across, there were a number of Sikhs. Oh, in the yes, boat. unbelievable. And then I showed a video. You, yes, yes. You, yes, you did. Yes, I did. And on the bottom of the screen, yeah. it said WTF seeking, mm -hmm. play on the word seeking, asylum. Mm -hmm. There's one particular group representing Sikhs and it is in the UK that has apparently contacted the station for an apology. Uh, because it's not going to get it. It's not going to get it. No. Okay. No, no, no. So, no, 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 no. Because, no, because of the con what they're saying is the contribution you know. of Sikhs in this country. What's that going to do? What's that going to do with it? And they feel that they have been slurred. Well, it's ludicrous. That's not true. Okay. No, 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 no. It's ludicrous. You know, why would Sikhs who are in Britain, who've come here legally, why would they think it's a good thing for Sikhs to be able to come in illegally? Do you know what it costs now? If you're a Sikh in India and you want to legally come to Britain, that process is probably going to cost you a couple of grand. You know, it, it's actually quite a lengthy, expensive process. There's an exam to go through. I mean, some of the concepts around legal British citizenship we've actually got right in the last few years. We have made it a bit more difficult, and that's a good thing. So why, when you've been through that process, should this, should this group of young men break every rule and cross? Now, what possible claim for refugee status do Sikhs from India have? None. But literally none under any definition, and yet you and I both know they'll all be allowed to stay. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there are supporters of the Khalistan movement that might disagree with you on that, but... Uh, well, come <laughs> on, I mean, yeah. I, I, okay. I mean you know, in, India has its tensions, yes, okay. of course that's true, but, but, but not, you know, not, not, not to the level of refugee status. With, you've already accepted in the past that if people have qualifications if they are if they are professionals um, and are like to be earning a certain level of income then you know we shouldn't be shutting <coughs> necessarily to them no no of course not that's okay. the, no, 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 no. that isn't the issue the issue here the issue here, look I have filmed right I have filmed people in the English Channel throwing their iPhones and passports into the channel I've played it on the station I've filmed it if people are doing that, they should, and there are no circumstances, if they're hiding their identity, in which they should be allowed to stay. It's quite simple. Would you ever want to see a situation, and this is talking broadly about it, it's not just talking about people coming up in boats, but it's talking about the broader issue of immigration, because there is a preference for people who are professionally qualified rather mm. than without any particular skills. Mm. Where, for example, the hospitals in Exeter, in mm. Torbay, in Plymouth, where those hospitals had consultants and doctors and surgeons who were immigrants, but all the cleaners and auxiliary staff are white working class mm. Brits. Mm. Would you, would you, would, is that a situation you want to see? I hadn't thought about it. I mean, what's the point? What's the question? Well, because what you're doing is you're saying what you're doing is you're saying that that only professionals coming into the country mm -hmm. um, with a certain level of, of standing and, and qualification yeah. are going to be useful to the country, but those... Oh, right, OK, two points with to that. make. Two, two points to make, right. Number one, a migrant legally coming into Britain is a net benefit to the economy if they're earning about £30,000 a year plus, all right? Because they're going to have kids and education and all the rest of it. So, so if, if you're looking purely at the economics of it, yeah, you want people who are high earners. You know, the, 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 there's no doubt about that, because then you remove any argument about burden. The real problem is numbers. Look, the British population has increased by 8 million since 2001. 8 million! And you wonder why we have to have smart motorways, and, there, and we can't get a GP appointment. The quality of life, the quality of life for the average family in this country has deteriorated. We have a huge population crisis. It is affecting everything. Housing, uh, yeah, all of it in the most dramatic way and no one appears to want to do anything about it so should we have a much much smaller number of people coming into Britain I mean remember you know from Windrush 
until 1999, 50 years, net migration ran at 30,000 a year. And it's now running at 500,000 a year. I, I, you know, these are very, th 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 these numbers bear no comparison to our previous experience of this in the past. Now, the biggest problem is, with all of this, and this is our culture, where we've gone wrong, <laughs> is that we've utterly downplayed trade and skills in the most amazing way. We haven't encouraged people to go into medicine and many other areas where we genuinely, engineering, many other areas where we genuinely got shortages. So, you know, some of this, some of this is incumbent upon us, but what I don't like, and what I really objected to for a long, long time, is the big business cultural influence on politicians, because basically they want cheap workers. And okay. I, don't, I don't want us to live in a low-wage economy. We've got, yeah, I, very little time left, so I just want to get two, two quick, yeah, quick, fine. quick fire ones in here. Uh, tw March 2014, when you were asked which current world leader you most admired, you mm. said, as an operator, but not as a human being, mm. Putin. Mm. How do you feel about Putin now? Well, he was a brilliant operator in Syria and places like that, and he managed to get a huge level of national support behind him. But I, I guess all that went away with the invasion of Crimea. Okay. You know, all that went away with the invasion of Crimea. You know, he turned Russia into an aggressor, seeking new territory. But I was right to say I didn't like him. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't take him out to meet Mum for tea. Reform UK mm. um, uh, wants to, one of its policies on health is to zero, have zero waiting lists. Great idea. Mm. I think everybody mm. wants that. But the idea is if you've been waiting more than a few days or whatever, you have this voucher to go private. Is your idea to be able to bolster the NHS, uh, bolster the NHS by bolstering the private health? I okay. think with, I think the private sector is able to respond more quickly to demand issues, either peaks in demand or falls, than is the state-run National Health Service. I think we should be encouraging people who can afford it to take out private health insurance. I think rather than saying, oh, isn't it awful, Rishi Sunak, he's used a private doctor, we should be saying, good for you, Rishi Sunak, because you can afford it and you're relieving the burden of the National Health Service. I think the whole debate needs to turn around and I think there's going to be, I think there's going to be a massive boom in private health care. And I think those that can afford it will increasingly start to go private and that, I think, is a very good thing for those that can't. Okay. Thank you very much, Nigel.